A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. The Social Transformations in the 20th Century. In this chapter, we will survey the social and economic developments and accomplishments of the Yoruba people in Nigeria in the 20th century. In the course of the century, the two imported religions, Christianity and Islam, grew widely among the Yoruba, and so did Western education, all of which brought significant formative influences into their lives. British imperialism, the growing impact of the world economy, the introduction of new tools, new methods of production, and new occupations, and the rise of a new class of literate Yoruba professionals political leaders, artisans, artists, and religious leaders all interconnected to contribute to the emergence of a transformed Yoruba society. In the general African struggle for socio-economic development and modernization in the century, Yoruba society in western Nigeria established itself as a pace-setter even, as would be remembered, in spite of the limitations imposed by the structural and political problems of a Nigeria of many nationalities. It is important to note that most of what follows here on educational and economic development refers to the Yoruba of the western region of Nigeria. The Yoruba of the northern region came to lag considerably behind those in the western region in education and most other fields of socio-economic development, because of the northern region's slower pace of development and modernization. Even so, they supplied a substantial share of the most educated persons in the public service of that region. Also, for most of the era of European rule in Africa, the French Protectorate of Dahomey, now Benin Republic, was a key source of civil servants in the French administrative structure in West Africa, and the Yoruba of the country were always a major part of these. Growth and Impact of Western Education The first decades of the century saw the Christian Mission primary schools spread into all corners of Yoruba land. By the 1920s, the missions were advancing their educational programs to the level of secondary schools and teacher training institutions. By the 1950s, at which time the British admitted Yoruba politicians into limited participation in the government of their people, purely government schools were few and far between, most schools being Christian mission schools. As a result, most Yoruba recipients of Western education in the century were products of Christian mission schools. No other single factor impacted 20th century Yoruba society as much as this. In the development of education, indigenous Yoruba participation was important from the beginning. Even before the Lagos Kingdom became a British colony in 1861, the people of Lagos had started to show interest in Western education. After 1861, that interest grew tremendously, as the influence of the Christian missions and the emigrants grew. The main initial incentive was that Western education provided sure access to high-level jobs in the services of the colonial government and the merchant firms. The same attitudes were later evinced in the rest of Yoruba land. Barring a brief initial resistance by kings and other prominent people in virtually every community. It was the indigenous converts that the churches mobilized to build the mission schools which mushroomed all over Yoruba land. Everywhere, from about the 1930s, important societal organs employed their influence to persuade parents to send their children to school. From the late 1920s, as earlier pointed out, the few literate persons in every community began to form themselves into development associations or progressive unions, their favorite agenda being the encouragement of parents to send children to school. When the constitutional changes of 194,951 brought these literate Yoruba into the government of their western region in the 1950s, they immediately made educational development the highest priority. Among other things, the regional government encouraged and assisted each sizable community to build a secondary school of its own and each administrative division to establish a teacher training institution. Then it embarked upon the ambitious program of free primary education, thus making the Yoruba people the first African people to institute a program of free education. As children began to graduate from the elementary schools, secondary schools sprang up to receive them. Almost all such were community schools or schools founded by Christian churches or Muslim communities. Since the beginning of the century, Yoruba Muslim communities had increasingly contributed to the growing movement of Western education, both at the elementary and secondary school levels. As T. Gabadamosi has shown in his study of the growth of Islam in Yoruba land, Yoruba Muslims, like Muslims all over the world, had reservations about Western education. In fact, as Christian mission schools had started and grown in Lagos in the late 19th century, Lagos Muslims had kept their children away from such schools until during the 1890s when the British colonial government of Lagos had taken steps expressly encouraging Muslim participation in the growing educational movement. Thereafter, although the Muslims continued to have reservations about Western education, they increasingly sent their children to the schools that were available, while building some schools of their own. 
By the late 1950s, the contribution of Yoruba Muslim communities and organizations to the establishment of schools had become very considerable, and some large secondary schools in the western region and Lagos were products of their efforts. In addition, a whole class of entrepreneurs emerged who invested in the establishment of private secondary schools. The massive increases in secondary school enrollment necessitated, in turn, more and more institutions of higher learning. In 1948, the British government of Nigeria had established Nigeria's first university, the University College, Ibadan, in the heart of Yoruba land. In 1962, two years after Nigeria's independence, the government of the Western region established a regional university, the University of Ife, Ila Ife, later, Obafemi Awolawo University. With the constitutional internal restructuring of the Nigerian Federation into smaller component states after independence, newly created Yoruba states founded universities of their own Ogun State University, Lagos State University, Oyo State University, Lado Kakantola University in Osun State, University of Adu Ekiti in Ekiti State, Adakun Leonjasin University in Ondo State, and a number of private universities and polytechnics, all in the 1980s, the 1990s and the first years of the 21st century. In 197,983, too, the Yoruba states expanded free education to the secondary school level. Economic Growth Economically, the Yoruba part of Nigeria experienced tremendous transformation during the 20th century. One of the immediate effects of the cessation of wars in the 1890s was the freeing of the country for a great deal of travel and trade, stimulating general economic growth and progress. Responding to the expansion in the volume and types of export goods, Yoruba farmers began to invest heavily in kalanut and coca plantations early in the 20th century. They also multiplied the production of palm oil and palm kernels. In commerce, there quickly emerged an energetic class of retailers to distribute the imported merchandise. The greatly improved transportation resulting from the coming of railways and the motor highways sped the commercial development on. The first part of the Nigerian railway system, the line from Lagos to the Niger and from there to Kano in northern Nigeria, was built in 1895-1912. At the same time, road transportation expanded steadily, also from Lagos. On the whole, the highway and motor vehicles helped the growth of the new internal trade in Yoruba land more than the railway. The impact of the railway was most pronounced along its corridor from Lagos to the north. In contrast, the motor road steadily fanned out, connecting town to town all over Yoruba land. By the 1920s, it had started to open up even the far eastern Yoruba areas like Ekiti and Ekoko. The usually strong competition among the European firms tended to ensure good profits for the retailers, it also ensured very good prices for the export produce. Meanwhile, long-distance trade between Yoruba land and the other parts of Nigeria, especially northern Nigeria, grew. In this, the railway was particularly influential. The ancient Kalana route connecting Ganja in northern Ghana to Busa on the Niger River was gradually abandoned as Kalanats from Ghana were shipped increasingly by sea to Lagos and then taken by rail to northern Nigeria. This stimulated the establishment of Kalanat plantations in the southern Yoruba forests, so that Yoruba Kalanats ultimately replaced the Ghanaian Kalanats. The corollary to this was the expansion of the old house of trade and cattle with Yoruba land. These commercial developments set in motion increasingly large migrations of people between House Land and Yoruba Land. The general economic advancements of the colonial era were somewhat disrupted by three events emanating from Europe in the first half of the 20th century, the First World War, the Great Depression, and the Second World War. Recruitment for armed service in the two wars, especially the Second World War, took large numbers of able-bodied men away from economic activities at home. The First World War led to the elimination of the German firms. Since these had had the most liberal credit policies of all the European firms, their elimination adversely affected the retailers and prices. Also, the First World War drastically reduced the flow of investment capital from Europe, it never fully recovered after 1918. The Great Depression and the Second World War again dealt serious blows at the flow of investment capital and also at British government-sponsored capital development. The Second World War also caused a serious shortage of goods. For some time, for instance, the whole of Yoruba land suffered terribly from the shortage of such a basic commodity as salt. The last years of the war also witnessed a major famine caused by drought and consequent shortfalls in food crop harvests. All these were, however, only interruptions in a generally upward-moving economic picture. Technological improvements, such as in transportation and communication, were irreversibly improving the economic development capacity of Yoruba land. The end of the Second World War the relaxation of wartime constraints and controls, a certain new increase in government-sponsored capital investment, 
the recovery of trade, and the innate virility of the Yoruba people themselves, all combined to produce a post-war economic boom in Yoruba land. In spite of the continuing deductions by the marketing boards, the income from produce soared, bringing an upsurge of wealth to the cash crop farmers and produce buyers, and making a lot of money available for buying goods from retailers. The building of more and more roads, and the government-sponsored supply of insecticides and fungicides, especially to cocoa farmers, helped the boom. More and more forest land was opened up for new cocoa farms. Industrialization began, especially around the port city of Lagos and the inland city of Ibadan. In the immediate hinterland of Lagos Island, at a place called Ikeja, a new industrial city began to grow. Perhaps the two most visible effects of the economic progress of the colonial era were the growth of education and the improvement of housing. The long strides taken in education have been described above. Suffice it to say here, therefore, that much of the wealth made by Yoruba families was expended on the education of their children and in the building of educational institutions. By 1910 the traditional thatched roofs had mostly disappeared in Lagos and largely in Abeokuta, while Ibadan was still a city of thatched roofs. Soon thereafter, Ibadan and other cities began to get the new metal roofs. By the late 1920s, the development was already reaching Akiti and Akoko in the Far East. The coming of metal roofs represented a major improvement in the quality of housing then. It also induced most who had the money for metal roofs to opt out of the old family compounds and build their own individual houses. This led to the beginning of the breaking up of the old sprawling family compounds into smaller houses, it also started the extension of Yoruba towns beyond their old town walls. From the moment that Yoruba political leaders were admitted into the government of the Western region in 1952, an era of very rapid economic and social development began. In education, as well as in many other areas of development, the Western region became a pace setter for the Nigerian Federation. Indeed, there was considerable euphoria caused among Yoruba people by the popular claim that, in most development endeavors, the Western region was first in Africa. The Yoruba cocoa farmers led the way. Their export produce became the main provider of funds for the development of the Western region and the biggest foreign exchange earner for Nigeria. As cocoa farming and cocoa trading became the richest sources of personal income, investments poured briskly into expanding cocoa plantations, and cocoa production volume soared. The regional government aided the growth with many support programs research, the supply of improved cocoa seedlings, subsidized supply of insecticides, establishment of a cocoa marketing board, the promotion of a cocoa cooperative movement, etc. These developments correspondingly stimulated all other areas of the economy. The regional government also invested heavily in encouraging private industries, as well as in government-sponsored industries. Ikeja on the outskirts of Lagos became a place with one of the heaviest concentrations of industry on the African continent. The government-sponsored Western Region Development Corporation, a holding corporation with many industrial, commercial, and service companies, had by the 1960s one of the largest accumulations of capital in Africa. The boom in the Western Region continued until the early 1960s. In the mid-1960s, the regional economy began to weaken partly as a result of the slump in the world price of cocoa but more particularly because of the political crisis in the western region which disrupted orderly growth for four years, 196,266. The Nigerian federal government made the regional situation much worse by taking over the functions of the regional cocoa board. The result of this federal action was a sharp decline in the quality of government attention to the cocoa industry. In the late 1960s, petroleum from the Niger Delta area emerged as Nigeria's principal foreign exchange earner. As cocoa farming lost virtually all governmental support and much of its profitability, farmers abandoned their cocoa plantations, and by the mid-1980s, Nigeria's cocoa export was a small fraction of what it had been in the late 1950s. A small part of the decline was due to the fact that traders began to smuggle cocoa to the neighboring Republic of Benin, where cocoa exports and smuggling earned better prices. The 196,266 crisis, then, more or less effectively pulled the Yoruba down from the high level of socio-economic progress that they had attained in the 1950s. As the 20th century came to a close, the Yoruba West in Nigeria had not returned to the brisk economic growth of the late 1950s, even though the momentum of the 1950s continued somewhat to sustain it in a leading place in Nigeria. The tradition of orderly, focused and disciplined promotion of development by the Yoruba leadership, characteristic of the Western region in the decade 195,262 and disrupted in 196,266, was never revived. The Yoruba achievements in literacy and higher education continued more or less to uphold general modernization in the Yoruba West in Nigeria. 
but governmental development of economic and social infrastructures, roads, water installations, etc., though showing some increases, slacken noticeably. Businesses and entrepreneurship continue to grow, but even in this, the great promise of the 1950s and the first two years of the 1960s largely waned. Perhaps most importantly, the confidence in leadership, in direction and in progress, so strongly evident in the Western region in 195,262, largely disappeared. In summary, the great expectations that Yoruba unity and collective dedication to modernization and socio-economic progress would continue to produce great attainments declined considerably in the decades after 1962. In 1986, the Nigerian federal government deregulated the export trade in cocoa as part of a national movement towards a free market economy. This meant that cocoa producers were freed to sell directly in the world market, unfettered by the government's bureaucratic controls. As a result, cocoa exporters showed renewed interest in the Yoruba West, thus bringing back to Yoruba cocoa farmers a little bit of the income levels of the 1950s. Cocoa farmers resumed care of their abandoned cocoa plantations, and Nigeria's cocoa exports began to rise again as the 20th century came to an end. This infused new funds into the economy of the Yoruba West and added a little to the widening of economic transformation in the growth of indigenous businesses, the rise of a business and entrepreneurial class, the growth of industry and commerce, and the growing strength of financial institutions and of technology. Changes in Family, Home, and Community For all African peoples, the 20th century was an era of great cultural transformations. For a people with such a rich cultural heritage as the Yoruba, it is impossible to do more in a book of this nature than give a very brief outline of the massive cultural transformations of the century. The dissolution of the Agbo Ilo or lineage compound was, without doubt, one of the greatest and most profound transformations of Yoruba society in the 20th century. The process of the dissolution has not yet, as at this writing, received any focused study. However, it is fairly well known from family traditions, court records, and published accounts in various media that the process was rocky in many places. Emotional attachment to the ancestral compound usually resulted in the circumstance that persons with financial resources for building new homes often sought to take a piece of the old compound, tear it down and build the new house in its place. Not infrequently, this produced conflicts of claims and disputes and feuds among lineage members. By about the last quarter of the century, the dissolution was virtually complete for most compounds, and the volume of fratricidal strife petered out. The fact that the dissolution was effected, in most cases, piece by piece over a long time and without any coordination, resulted in considerable deterioration of the physical structure of the old Yoruba cities and towns houses built in disorder on the sites of once beautiful compounds, large quarters impossible to provide with paved roads, serious problems of hygiene arising from lack of sewage and trash disposal arrangements. By the last decades of the century, Persons desiring to build new houses tended mostly to go beyond the old town walls to land that used to be farmland. As a result, by, say, the year 2000, every sizable Yoruba town had two segments the old town within the old town walls, and then the new town beyond them. The latter, being usually a place of land layouts and building plans approved by the local governments, was normally much more orderly and attractive than the former. The effects of the dissolution of the Agbo Ila on lineages and on society in general were quite complex. A dispersal of most of each Agbo Isle's lineage followed. However, a core of the lineage members of each Agbo Isle continued to inhabit its old site in their new types of houses thus constituting a strong pull on dispersed members. Even in the growing new town beyond the town walls, the members of each lineage tended also to build homes close together since each lineage gave land to its members on land that had used to be its farmland although it also usually sold plots to non-members. Moreover, the old lineage functions, funerals of departed members, naming ceremonies for newly born members, engagement ceremonies and weddings, contests over the selection of chiefs, chieftaincy installation rituals and ceremonies, annual and seasonal lineage rituals, sacrifices and festivals, continued also a strong force pulling members together. And the old obligations for the welfare of members remained indestructible so that even the farthest dispersed members of a lineage still accepted and bore responsibilities for the welfare of other members. Consequently, although the Agbo Ila disintegrated, the social and psycho-spiritual bonds uniting its lineage survived quite strongly. At the end of the 20th century, the lineage factor continued to be a very major factor in Yoruba society. It is important to note, in conclusion, that all that has been said here about the Agbo Ila and lineage is applicable to Yoruba people, not only in Nigeria, but also in Benin and Togo republics. Religious Transformation In the course of the 20th century, 
the two important religions, Islam and Christianity, exerted very profound influences on Yoruba culture. Their various levels of contribution to the growth of Western education and literacy have been briefly described. But their influences were much more encompassing than that. In fact, they accounted for a very significant part of the changes in Yoruba society in the century. As incoming and growing influences, both Islam and Christianity ultimately attained high levels of integration into Yoruba society, but their paths to that end differed considerably. As Gabadamosi has shown, Islam, while basically regarding Yoruba religious norms and practices, as well as much of Yoruba social ways, as unacceptable, consistently sought inclusion into Yoruba society as a way to promote the kind of changes that Islamic tenets preach. For instance, Yoruba Muslims generally made a point, from as early as the late 19th century, of using, and promoting pride in, the varied styles of Yoruba traditional clothes and costumes for special occasions, thereby contributing greatly to the refinement and beauty that these acquired in the course of the 20th century. Yoruba traditional investiture of chiefs elect into chieftaincy positions, and the traditional functions of chiefs, continue to be rooted in traditional religious practices. If a Muslim was made a chief, therefore, the Muslim community could not approve of the religious ramifications of his position but they developed the tradition of going about this matter cautiously and establishing relationships with the chief that harnessed his political influence for the benefit of Islam in the community. Since Islam does not preach monogamy, Yoruba Muslims had no problem with the polygamy in the Yoruba family system. Moreover, Muslim communities in every town cultivated linkages with the traditional political system until, in most towns, the point was reached that persons appointed leaders in the Muslim communities were usually turbaned in the Aba palaces just as the investiture of traditional chiefs was done in the palaces. Unlike Muslim communities in many parts of the world, Yoruba Muslim communities, in deference to the very significant influence that women had traditionally exercised in Yoruba society, accepted them fully into participation in prayers in mosques, as well as into leadership positions. There were, of course, always some Muslims who rejected these tendencies in Yoruba Islam and preached fervently against them as unacceptable compromises. However, such radicals were always few and, without doubt, mainstream Yoruba Islam gained much acceptance and strength by pursuing the path of inclusion and by being respectful of Yoruba cultural norms. The expansion and establishment of Islam resulting from all this received, from time to time, big boosts from indigenous, mainstream preachers who traveled over Yoruba land, preaching Islam, gathering in converts, and establishing or strengthening Muslim communities. Islam became more or less a popular Yoruba religion and Yoruba Muslims imported into Islamic festivals and activities the Yoruba love of ceremony, glamour, music and dance. For instance, setting off for, or arriving back from, the pilgrimage to Mecca, became a glamorous and festive ceremony, and so did the ordinary act of admission to Islam through a baptism like rite known as Wanka, al haji for men, and al haja for women. The titles for persons who would perform the pilgrimage, became proud and fashionable titles in Yoruba land. Not surprisingly, Although Islam was not as strong as in Hausaland in the northern region, the government of the western region under Awolawo's premiership was the first government in Nigerian history to establish a pilgrim's welfare board, whose function was to help and care for Muslims on the pilgrimage to Mecca. With Christianity, the path was different. The various Christian missions started in the mid-19th century with European missionaries in charge and Yoruba emigrant, and ultimately other Yoruba, clergy serving as their assistants. The optimistic projection at this early stage was that, as each mission station matured, the Yoruba clergy would take over, and the white missionary would move on to start another station. As time went on, however, the white missionaries became unwilling to move on to new stations unwilling to start again the pioneering work and the raising of support from backers in Europe. More importantly, the European imperialist agents began, in the 1890s, to take over Yoruba land, and all of Africa, and with that, Anthropological theories claiming intellectual and moral inferiority of the black race gained ground among Europeans in general. The European Christian missions largely became influenced by these theories and the attitudes they engendered, and members of the Yoruba clergy began to suffer discrimination in the service of the missionary bodies. In the context of these new ideas and behavior, even the pioneer work done on the Niger mission by Bishop Ajayi Crowther and many Yoruba clergymen came to be treated as undeserving of honorable reward and many of those clergymen were disgraced from their ministerial jobs. In Yorubland, the most important consequence of these developments was the growth of a cleavage between the European and Yoruba clergy, and the rise of an African church movement. The African church movement was pioneered by the seceding Yoruba clergy from the various Protestant mission churches. It resulted in the emergence of an African, or native, Anglican, Baptist, 
and Methodist Church. Its central thrust was the indigenization of Christian evangelism and worship, while keeping faithful to the message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It introduced indigenous Yoruba music, with a lot of drumming, into church services and became prodigious in the writing of hymns and publishing of hymnals. The mission churches had rejected the Yoruba institution of polygamy, the African churches accepted the believing polygamist into full membership of the church. The African churches emphasized evangelism and charged all church members, clergy and lay alike, with the duty of evangelizing in the wider Yoruba society. They also endorsed the Ogboni cult, which had been very influential in the political life of Yoruba communities and, as will be seen below, even created a Christian version of Ogboni. In the course of the early 20th century, the Christian Ogboni fraternity or society, sometimes also called Reformed Ogboni, became a broad association of the Yoruba political, social and religious elite, promoting unity in their ranks and in Yoruba land in general. Thus, on the whole, the African church movement may be regarded as one of the first major expressions of African nationalism in Nigeria. By the second decade of the 20th century, then, there were three broad streams in Yoruba Christianity the Protestant mission churches, the Roman Catholic churches, and the African churches. For all three, schools remained a major tool for winning people to Christianity. To the schools, another type of institution was added in the course of the first half of the century church hospitals and maternity centers. In addition, as the efficacy of the methods, especially the use of Yoruba music and drums, employed by the African churches became self-evident, the mission churches, and to a lesser extent the Roman Catholic churches, gradually adopted them too. In the Protestant mission churches and the Roman Catholic churches, Yoruba clergy gradually took over. Yoruba popular culture, like dressing styles and colorful ceremonies, came gradually to be firmly established in the lives of all church congregations. From the 1920s, a powerful new movement spread in Yoruba Christianity namely, the Aladura movement. Aladura means the ones who pray or the praying people and the churches of the Aladura movement were characterized by very strong belief in the power of prayer. In Yoruba traditional religion, supplications, sacrifices and rituals to gods and spirits were believed to attract intervention by those gods and spirits into the daily lives and affairs of the supplicants for the healing of sickness, for the removal of life's difficulties, for the increase of success, for deliverance from oppression by hostile spirits, etc. Of the two imported religions, Islam featured a tradition of praying for divine assistance in life's travails, and of special supplications, but Christianity as spread by the European missions did not that is. The mission churches focused only on eternal salvation but could not offer their members spiritual healing from sickness, deliverance and protection from evil spirits, divine guidance, and success. In order to fill this gap in Christianity, some Yoruba clergy of the mission and African churches moved out and started the Aladura movement in 1918. The Aladura churches represented a conscious step towards integrating Yoruba culture and the Christian faith, and they rapidly became very popular. As the Aladura churches offered many earthly benefits to their members through powerful prayers, fasting, observances, and rituals that seemed, in some ways, not too dissimilar from traditional Yoruba rituals, large numbers flocked into their congregations. Not surprisingly, foreigners and leaders of the mission churches strongly criticized the new movement as not being true Christianity but a new Yoruba religion, or an imperfect hybrid religion, but criticisms did not do anything to slow down its growth. Ultimately, Four major branches of the Aladura movement developed the Apostolic Church, the Cherubim and Seraphim Church, the Church of the Lord, and the Celestial Church of Christ, all founded and led by Yoruba clergymen. Each of these developed its own unique spiritual emphasis, but in general they worked through prayers, the scriptures, fasting, blessed water, blessed oil, candles, various rituals, visions and dreams, and prophesying. Unlike members of the mission, Roman Catholic and African churches, Members of most of the branches of the Aladura churches early started to wear special clothing for church and church activities usually a white robe, with trimmings or sashes of other colors for ministers and other church officials. All the Aladura churches laid a strong emphasis on evangelism and demanded it of every member, and some developed the practice of proclaiming the Christian message, with bell and Bible in hand, through the streets. All rejected Yoruba traditional religion, as well as the use of medicine, modern or traditional. Unlike the Protestant mission churches, the Roman Catholic churches and the African churches, the Aladura churches contributed only minimally to the establishment of schools and hospitals. Every branch of the Aladura movement emphasized in its services and practices the use of Yoruba music, drums and songs, and festive dancing. Congregations of Aladura churches sprang up in every Yoruba town and village. 
The Aladu movement was a product of Yoruba creativity, a unique Yoruba contribution to the history of Christianity. Soon, the Yoruba were exporting the movement to the rest of West Africa, and even to Yoruba and other African people resident in various places in Europe and America. In the course of the first half of the century, yet another movement entered into the world of Christianity and Yoruba land, namely, the Pentecostal movement, also known as the Charismatic movement. The Pentecostal movement started in the United States early in the century. Its central doctrine was the belief in the ready availability of the power of God, or the Holy Spirit, to the Christian, for miraculous outcomes such as miraculous healing, deliverance from demonic possession or oppression, miraculous protection from danger, miraculous supply of needs. This movement was, thus, close to the Aladura movement in its basic belief. Like the Aladura movement also, it believed in the power of prayer and fasting, but unlike the Aladura movement. It rejected all forms of rituals and sacrifices and formularies, as well as such tools as holy water and special robes. In contrast, it emphasized knowledge of, and intense familiarity with, scriptures as, together with prayers and fasting and faith, the means of accessing and imploring the power of the Holy Spirit for intervention in earthly events and circumstances. It also preached a higher spiritual experience known as Holy Ghost Baptism, the outward manifestation of which could include the ability to speak in strange tongues. The Aladura movement appealed mostly to the illiterate and less educated among the Yoruba, the Pentecostal movement, on the other hand, appealed mostly to the more educated to high school and university students and graduates and their like. It employed a lot of music and song and dancing, just like the Aladura movement, but its type of music was close to American gospel choruses and American popular music, and its lyrics were mostly in English, usually accompanied with guitar, band set, and amplifiers. The Pentecostal movement produced a very great number of songs and choruses in English and Yoruba, and it also borrowed richly from Pentecostal songs and choruses composed in the languages of other southern Nigerian peoples, among whom Pentecostalism was also very strong. Its clergy, dressed simply in Western business suits, were the most fiery gospel preachers in 20th century Yoruba Christianity. From about the late 1960s, the Pentecostal movement swept the schools and colleges and universities, as well as the ranks of educated people, throughout Yoruba land. The earliest groups in this movement were from America, notably the Assemblies of God, and Four Square Gospel Church, but by the 1970s, more American groups had come, and indigenous groups, founded and led by highly educated Yoruba persons, some of them university professors who gave up their academic careers for the Christian ministry, were springing up. By the 1990s, some of these homegrown groups, like the Redeemed Christian Church of God founded by Josiah Kendaomi, Deeper Life Bible Fellowship founded by William Fuller Unzo Kumuyi, Winner's Chapel by David Oyadepo, etc., counted their members in the millions and boasted some of the largest Christian congregations and church buildings in the world. Some of the Yoruba Pentecostal churches and members developed global visions to a commitment to a reverse missions program aimed at taking the gospel message to Europe and America in order to revive Christianity there. By the last years of the century, there are usually large congregations, made up of persons of all races, and founded and led by Yoruba clergy, were to be found all over Western and Eastern Europe, North America, and many countries of Africa and Asia. In the first years of the 21st century, Perhaps one of the most famous of these Yoruba missionaries abroad is Pastor Sunday Adelaja, whose Christian mission is based in the city of Kiev in the Ukraine. Nurtured in the Pentecostal tradition in Nigeria, Adelaja arrived in 1986 as a young college student in Belarus, then part of Communist Soviet Union, and started a small underground Pentecostal church in action that was to cause him repeated troubles with the police. In the early 1990s, Adelija moved to Ukraine a few years after it broke away from the Soviet Union and founded his church, which quickly attracted many influential Ukrainians. By the year 2007, the Congregation of the Embassy of the Blessed Kingdom of God, more commonly known as God's Embassy, in Kiev numbered more than 25,000 members, virtually all of them Ukrainians. By that date also, his church had spread to most countries of Europe and become, according to one writer on the subject, Europe's largest church with an estimated 2 million members in more than 600 congregations, located in more than 20 countries, most of them in Europe, and some as far afield as India and the United States of America. As a result of these developments in Islam and Christianity among the Yoruba, most Yoruba were professed Muslims or Christians by the end, or even as early as the middle, of the 20th century, and only a small and dwindling minority continued to adhere explicitly to the traditional religion and ways of worship. Consequently, resources and talent moved away from the old shrines, and many shrines became poor or even dilapidated or even perished. 
However, all this did not mean that the influence of the traditional beliefs and spiritual practices disappeared. On the contrary, the influence of the traditional religion and some of its institutions remained quite strong. Yoruba monarchical and chieftaincy systems remained more or less firmly based on their ancient religious and spiritual roots. The influence of the Babalawo and Adahunts remained, and so did their traditional services, in divination and the provision of spiritual protection, success and power through charms, sacrifices and formularies. And in every Yoruba community, certain seasonal and annual rituals and festivals, for many centuries pillars of the political and social system, continued and continued to rally the citizens, including even the Islamized or Christianized, and the lineages that had traditionally held the priesthoods for them continued to do so, in spite of losses of their members to the new religions. One incident in Aduakiti in the 1940s illustrates these trends very poignantly. Once every new yam season from an unknown antiquity, the Oitato festival of the deity known as Elephon had rallied the citizens of Aduakiti in large festive gatherings at the U.S. Palace and in the streets, as well as in the cooking and sharing of the most cherished foods. Sometime in the 1940s, the young man who was the then high priest for the festival became converted to Christianity by the Roman Catholics, and his new Christian friends then spirited him out of Aduakiti and into hiding. For two years, although the lower priests of Oitato kept the festival going, the absence of the high priest was like a torment to the whole town even though most Aduakiti people were by then professed Muslims or Christians. When the festival approached in the third year, the young high priest told his hosts at his place of hiding that he just had to return home into his priesthood, because he knew that he was hurting his community far too much. And his return made the Oitato festival of that year one of the largest and loudest in the modern history of Aduakiti. In short, some festivals, some observances, were too integral to the essence of community in every Yoruba town or village to be given up yet in the 20th century no matter how Islamized or Christianized the Yoruba people had become. And some lineages, traditionally priests and leaders in community festivals and observances, continued doggedly to serve their communities in their ancient roles. In most Yoruba communities, there developed the tendency to relate to and handle traditional community festivals in ways that downplayed their religious and spiritual connotations while emphasizing and promoting their purely social and community rallying importance and the standard to guarantee the survival and continuance of many a traditional community festival in all parts of Yoruba land. Side by side with the above picture, however, the influence of both Islam and Christianity continues to deepen significantly among the Yoruba at the turn of the century. Generally better educated than the generation of their parents, the younger generation of Yoruba people tend to adhere more to the fundamentals of their Islamic or Christian faith, thereby distancing themselves from the spiritual ramifications of their indigenous culture. Many, especially the Pentecostal Christians, also known as born-again Christians, now commonly drop or modify family names that are perceived by them to honor traditional Yoruba deities or idols. While planning for the funerals of departed parents or grandparents, Families tend to be split on account of religious differences with the younger and more ardent Muslims or Christians refusing to approve of traditional funeral practices that they regard as pagan. More and more Yoruba kings who are of Islamic or Christian faith are daring to move away from the traditional spiritual roots of Yoruba monarchy and boldly inculcating their own religion into the spiritual life of their palaces. Spiritually, as in many other respects, the Yoruba society of the beginning of the 21st century is a very dynamic society. Changes in Occupations Increasingly throughout the 20th century, the growing changes in the economy and in the way of life produced great changes in occupations. Peasant farming with the traditional tools, mostly hoes and machetes or cutlasses, continued even till the end of the 20th century to be the way of life of most Yoruba people employed in the traditional economy. However, education had drawn most of the younger generation away from the land resulting in much loss of talent to farming, and increasing dependence on food from other parts of Nigeria or imported from abroad. From early in the century, plantation farming, in cocoa and kalanuts and, to a lesser extent, in palm trees and rubber, gradually increased, mostly in the forest areas of Yoruba land. The establishment of the plantations was accomplished mostly with the traditional hoes and machetes, but plantation owners gradually became familiar with the use of new tools like pesticides and some crop dryers and crop processing machinery. The old occupation of palm oil and palm kernel production continued to enjoy a boost to produce for home consumption and for export and it slowly incorporated new processing equipment, such as mechanical oil presses and kernel crackers. The old cloth industry, yarn spinning on spindles, dyeing, weaving, and sewing, went through many changes. With the introduction of factory-produced cotton yarn, silk yarn and synthetic yarn, traditional spinning on spindles gradually declined. 
cloth weaving and dyeing became very creative, resulting in large varieties of colorful fabrics called asoafi, cloth woven on traditional looms, and the introduction of new, factory-produced, colors into traditional fabrics. Production of the type of Yoruba cloth called tie and dye, adir, became a popular occupation and, indeed, spread to many parts of the world. Much of the family treasuries of old beads survived and continue to be preferred over newly imported beads, for important uses such as status accessories for kings and chiefs, ceremonial adornment at funerals, traditional rituals, weddings, etc. New beads came only from imports, and never matched old beads in prestige. As far as is known, the old occupation of bead production disappeared. Gold came increasingly to supplement beads as jewelry, and a new class of goldsmiths emerged. As far as is known, the old occupation of brass jewelry making, producing brass neck bands, bangles, wristlets and anklets, died out. And so, gradually, did the use of the heavy brass jewelry. A whole large class of modern garment designers and tailors, male and female, emerged, employing imported sewing machines, and creatively using also offie, as well as many varieties of imported fabrics, lace, damask, silk, synthetics, etc., to produce your baklozik bata, daisuki, gabari, Sokoto and others for men, and Iro, Buba, Hela, Ibaran for women. The occupation of the Babalawal, the diviner, continued to enjoy great influence, and so did that of the Anasgun, the herbalist, in spite of the growing popularity of European medicine and hospitals. In fact, in the course of the century, many pharmacopoeias and other books on Yoruba traditional medicine were published, and some effort was made to standardize the preparation of Yoruba herbal medications and to streamline their prescription and administration. Research was also undertaken in some universities into particular Yoruba herbs. Blacksmiths continued to produce iron goods for the market, but their importance in the economy was gradually wiped out by factory-produced and imported iron goods. Side by side with these and other traditional occupations, education and the growth of the new economy were spawning a large array of practitioners of new local occupations furniture makers using the new mechanical tools, sawyers, letter writers, printers and bookbinders, bicycle and motor mechanics barbers and hairdressers, various artisans connected with the house-building trade, masons, brick makers and bricklayers, concrete mixers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, house painters, etc. In commerce, the marketplaces in Yoruba towns continued to be the almost exclusive province of women traders, while men engaged in the retail trade tended to set up shop in the front rooms of dwelling houses along town streets, to sell mostly imported goods. Bringing their traditional commercial expertise and enterprise into the new economy, Yoruba women commanded substantial shares of the new import and export commerce. Yoruba women importers of foreign fabrics usually went to faraway countries, various parts of Europe, as well as countries such as Hong Kong, Taiwan and South Korea and Asia, in order to guide manufacturers to produce the designs acceptable in the Yoruba market in Nigeria. The evolving modern government and economy gave rise to professional civil servants, teachers, pastors, lawyers judges, industrialists and industrial workers, owners of, and workers in, large mercantile businesses, transportation companies, civil engineering companies engaged in large public and private construction projects, import and export companies. In short, in response to the demands of the evolving new society, the occupational activities of Yoruba people saw a great deal of transformation resulting in the emergence of countless new occupations the disappearance of some old occupations, the modification and strengthening of some old occupations, and steady improvements in people's productive and earning capacity. Cultural Nationalism and Cultural Growth From the last years of the 19th century, Yoruba land experienced a strong and growing movement of cultural nationalism, championed mostly by the growing literate elite. In tropical Africa in general, European conquest and rule, beginning in the last years of the 19th century, reinforced, and fed on. The race theories increasingly prevalent among Europeans, theories asserting an intellectual, moral and cultural inferiority of the black race. In Yorubland, therefore, British conquest and rule, proudly called Pax Britannica, came to assume for itself the mission of civilizing the Yoruba. The Christian missions, as earlier pointed out, increasingly endorsed those theories, and, therefore, Christian evangelism and Western education came to mean, for them a two-pronged mission for winning the Yoruba from the supposed barbarism of their culture. In this context, the Christianized and the Western-educated Yoruba were projected as the advance guard of a new Yoruba people, as much as possible European in culture, manners and dress. In the mission schools, students were taught that a renunciation of the culture of their society customs, indigenous names, clothing, 
and language was essential to attaining their new status of civilized people. A contemporary described sarcastically in these words what the missionaries were trying to achieve, that which distinguishes a heathen from a Christian is not moral character or allegiance to Christ, but outward dress. The stovepipe hat, the feathered bonnet, the high-heeled shoes, the gloved hands, and all these under the burning tropical heat, make a man a Christian gentleman. To begin with, the Western educated, the emigrants, and many of the Christian converts did make efforts to become like Europeans in the hope that that would earn them acceptance into the European community as equal members. In dress, in language, in personal names, and in various other details of life, many of the Western educated generally tried hard to meet the expectations of their European teachers and mentors. In Lagos in particular, the emigrants came to command such social influence, wealth and power as to constitute a distinct and prestigious elite which built and promoted schools and academies mostly under church sponsorship, and proudly promoted a European way of life. A strong culture of European music and opera even made its appearance in Lagos. In extreme cases, some members of the Lagos emigrant elite, born and raised in Lagos and sent abroad for higher education, were known, on returning home as graduates of British schools or universities, to claim ignorance of the Yoruba language. Inevitably, many voices came to be raised against these trends. Of these the most prominent were the Anglican bishop, James Johnson, the West Indian intellectual, Edward Wilmot Blyden, and D.B. Vincent, a pastor of the Native Baptist Church. Both Johnson and Blyden spent all their lives championing the cause of African culture Blyden through his writings, and James Johnson in his activities in the church. Neither, however, went as far as D.B. Vincent in actually adopting an indigenous Yoruba way of life. In 1894, D.B. Vincent changed his name to Mojola Agbibai. Thereafter, he toured Britain and America giving lectures on African culture, and he made a lifelong decision to wear Yoruba clothes. Not even the winter cold in Britain or America was strong enough to make him put off his Yoruba Agbata. Ultimately, a very powerful movement of cultural nationalism emerged among the emigrants, the Western educated, and the Christian converts. Those who had avidly adopted European ways had gradually become disappointed about the outcome. Not only were they not being accepted by Europeans as equals, they were, in fact, increasingly ridiculed by Europeans as caricatures of Europeans and as inferior to the authentic native African. Those who were merchants found their businesses seriously threatened, or even destroyed, by the monopolistic practices of the European merchant companies, assisted by the policies of the colonial government. Those who worked in the civil service of the British administration of Lagos were discriminated against in every aspect of the service and treated as inferior. For all these people, therefore, there was no other option than to return to their own native civilization. As EAI and L has shown, the consequent Yoruba attacks on European cultural imperialism came from various sources at the same time. Western-educated Lagosians began to attack the Christian missions as promoters of cultural imperialism, and these attacks grew increasingly trenchant in the Lagos newspapers as the 20th century opened. Some of the Lagosians employed in the civil service of the British administration of Lagos, rather than continue to endure the racial discrimination in the service, resigned and became self-employed citizens, and even founded churches of their own, churches completely free of European missionary influence. Meanwhile, the rapid increases in the number of Christian converts at the turn of the century in many parts of Europe and made control by the European missionaries gradually impossible even in the mission churches. More and more, Yoruba clergy assumed control and by as early as 1900, Anglican, Wesleyan and Baptist mission churches in places like Abeokuta, Ijebuot and Ibadan had a Yoruba majority on their clergy and on their church councils. The grand outcome of all this was a mighty upswell of Yoruba cultural nationalism, among the emigrants, Western-educated, and Christian converts and ultimately in the general population. Regretting the readiness with which they had earlier accepted European foreign customs, the emigrants and Western-educated turned around and began to proclaim and promote intense pride in their native culture, customs, and institutions. European cultural imperialism, they said, threatens to extinguish us as a race, and one Lagos newspaper wrote, we are Negroes first and Christians afterwards. By 1914, the new movement was so vehement in the Lagos press that both the European missionaries and the British administration were alarmed. The movement manifested in many areas of the life of its champions and the rest of Yoruba society. Perhaps its most important institutional product was the revival of the ancient institution of Ogboni. The British and the missionaries had been very hostile to Ogboni, regarding it as an influential threat to both Christianity and British pacification of Yoruba land. The British had destroyed its council chamber in Ijebuot in 1892, and also later suppressed its influence in the government of Abeokuta. 
Ogboni as an institution looked as if it was on the way to disappearing. In response, the Champions of Cultural Nationalism acted to save Ogboni and convert it to a Christian society for the benefit of the Yoruba people. Under the leadership of Rev. T.A.J. Ogunbiyi, a senior pastor in the African Church Movement, a Christian Ogboni society was founded. The new Ogboni society was the ancient Ogboni itself in most details but remodeled as a Christian institution, structured as a prestigious association of the modern Yoruba elite for the preservation of Yoruba civilization and integrity, within the culture of Christianity, and claiming its power from the God of the Christian faith. It enshrined a copy of the Bible in each of its council houses, consecrated the ancient paraphernalia of the Ogboni as instruments of God's power, limited its membership only to Christians, and substituted Christian oaths for the ancient Yoruba oaths. Altogether, the creation of the Christian Ogboni Society was an important step in integrating Christianity into Yoruba political culture at its highest level, and in making Christianity powerfully relevant to the political life of the Yoruba nation. It was also a major contribution to the movement of Yoruba national unity. The Christian Ogboni Society, more commonly known as the Reformed Ogboni Society, was later to occupy a central place in Egbe Omo Oduduwa, Association of Descendants of Oduduwa. Cultural nationalism also produced effects at more ordinary levels of the culture. Many who bore English last names renounced them and took Yoruba names. A great pride in Yoruba clothing and fashions developed. Traditional rulers had never wavered from upholding pride in indigenous Yoruba clothing and ceremonial dress, and the generality of the Yoruba people had never been touched by the desire to look like Europeans. Moreover, as earlier pointed out, Yoruba Muslims, among the general population, had generally given deliberate emphasis to traditional clothes. The emigrants, Western educated and Christians now joined in the crusade to use, and popularize pride in, indigenous Yoruba clothes. Yoruba politicians soon followed. By the time of the first Yoruba government of the Western region in the 1950s, pride in indigenous dress had completely won the day. Yoruba clothing entered upon a colorful revolution in refinement and beautification featuring creative uses of indigenous and foreign fabrics, a reinvention of the old art of embroidery, experimentation with new styles of couture, and adaptation of old, new, and exotic accessories. Yoruba women, historically the leaders in fashion, led in this wave of experimentation and style. By the end of the century, Yoruba clothing and styles of dressing were being widely adopted in most parts of Nigeria, some parts of West Africa, and even in African-American societies in the Americas. Yoruba cultural nationalism also generated an outpouring of writing on the Yoruba people, especially on their origin and history. As would be remembered, the earliest literate Yoruba had started to write about Yoruba history and institutions as early as the middle of the 19th century. In the atmosphere created by Yoruba cultural nationalism from the 1890s, there arose a great desire among literate Yoruba to find out about the history and institutions of their nation and to put their findings into writing. As written knowledge from Yoruba oral traditions accumulated, Lagosians asked the British administration of the colony to add Yoruba history to the school curriculum. J. A. Otanba Payne continued to be a leading writer on Yoruba history, publishing in 1894 his Table of Principal Events in Yoruba History. In Odondo, Bishop Charles Phillips recorded in writing some of the traditions of the Yondo Kingdom. Other significant publications of the time included historical notes on the Yoruba country and its tribes by J. A. O. George, and a series of articles published in the newspaper, The Weekly Record, in June and July 1901 under the title A Short History of the Ijeshes and Other Hinterland Tribes by H. Achindeolu. Meanwhile, the most comprehensive of the books on Yoruba history of the time was being compiled by the Rev. Samuel Johnson from oral traditions collected by him in various places in Yoruba land. Titled The History of the Yorubas, this book was completed in 1897, but was not published until 1921. Following the publication of Johnson's book, the 20th century developed into a great century of Yoruba historical studies. In practically all parts of Yoruba land during the first half of the century, literate people wrote the histories of their kingdoms or communities, using the information from the oral traditions. Toy and Falola has, in a recent book, highlighted the historical work of a few of these tens of local historians M. C. Yemi, the historian of Oyo, Ova Isaac Babalola Akineli, and Kemi Morgan, historians of Ibadan, Chief Samuel Ohobada, the historian of Aloran, Chief Theophilus Olabodava, the historian of Badagri and Ape, and others, like P.O. Dada, J.O.A. Ogandaji and others, who wrote on the history of parts of Igbomna. Of the many others who are not examined in Falola's book, among the best known are Reverend Father Anthony Oguntuyi, the historian of Aduakiti, Chief M. B. Ashara, the historian of Owo, J. D. Abiola, the historian of Ilesa, 
and chief Isolof Abunmi, the historian of Ife. Many of these local historians wrote in English, but many others wrote in the Yoruba language. From the 1950s, the study of Yoruba history advanced to another level, with many studies and books by academic historians, most of whom were Yoruba, from various universities. The publication of two books in the 1950s and 1960s, one by Sabori Biobaku on Igba history, the other by J. F. Adeyajayi on the coming of the Christian missions, inaugurated the new era of academic historians. In addition to historians, academics and other disciplines soon joined in Yoruba studies archaeologists, art historians, scholars of linguistics, etc., again very many of them Yoruba. The result was a large and growing number of important studies and books on Yoruba history and other areas of Yoruba studies as the 20th century came to an end and the 21st commenced. The 20th century era of Yoruba literacy and cultural ferment also nurtured a rich outflow of literary work in fiction, myths, legends, folktales, poetry, music and theater. Most of such writing derived its materials from the Yoruba culture's enormous wealth of folklore. Again. Many of these Yoruba literary men and women of the century wrote in English while many others wrote in Yoruba. Of the writings of this nature in Yoruba, the preeminent work was that of Dio Fagunwa, who wrote a series of great legends that became acknowledged as classics of the Yoruba language and literature. His most famous work, Agba Juod Ninu Igbo Arunmuli, was translated into English and became a very significant educational tool. Yoruba literature in English attained its highest peak in the work of Wole Soinka who acquired much renown worldwide for his plays, novels, poetry and other writings, became the first African to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, and traveled the world extensively teaching African literature and culture. The Yoruba tradition of the itinerant entertainer, Alaranjo, blossomed during the 20th century into a rich indigenous traveling theater movement which borrowed creatively from European drama traditions, employed modern technology, like motorized transport, modern lighting, costumery, and even cinema technology and nurtured many traveling theater groups producing operatic works for popular entertainment. The movement started from Yoruba church music and opera, and its earliest practitioners were former school teachers and church organists who had produced music and opera in their churches and Christian schools. The mission churches had started in the 19th century by prohibiting the use of Yoruba indigenous music in church services, because such music was regarded as carrying pagan connotations. One of the effects of Yoruba cultural nationalism in the churches in general was the increasingly assertive use of Yoruba music and dancing in services and other church activities by the beginning of the 20th century. Among Yoruba clergy and teachers, there rose many, like Mojola Agbibai, A. K. Ajisof, I. O. Kuti, who became very active in adapting or creating Yoruba songs for church organs and other Western musical instruments. Since these composers worked basically with the church organ, Many of their compositions tended to have a syncretic character that is, Yoruba songs with typically European tones, a type of production which became known as native airs. These early native air operas produced in churches and schools came to serve as the modern route for the growth of the new Yoruba opera. Some of the men who led in the production of the church native air operas went out of the Christian church and school system, and began to create works in the Yoruba language works that were based on purely traditional models, especially the model of the Alaranjo entertainment groups, and derived their plots, themes, songs, music and musical instruments, cultural character, dance systems, etc., from the enormous wealth of Yoruba culture, folklore, traditions, religion, philosophy, festivals and rituals. Of the opera groups that thus arose, the most famous of the earliest ones were Hubert Agunde Theater, Tola Ogunmola Theater, and Duro Ladipo Theater. The traveling theater was a very important and unique part of the outstanding Yoruba contributions, in music, dance and various types of entertainment, to the popular culture of modern Nigeria and Africa in the 20th century. In the course of the second half of the 20th century, the Yoruba people also began to produce many notable playwrights whose works belonged to Western drama and theater traditions. This important cultural development had its roots in the emerging universities in Nigeria as well as universities abroad. Like the people of the traveling opera groups, these playwrights derived their plots in general from Yoruba history, folklore, and traditions. Unlike the traveling opera groups, however, they wrote in the English language. By the last years of the century, there were many of these playwrights, the most notable ones being Wole Soinka, Ola Rotimi, Wole Ogunyemi, and Femi Asafizan. Wole Soinka was the leader in this cultural development, and became recognized worldwide as one of the greatest playwrights in the English language in the 20th century. As the 20th century drew to a close, a modern cinema or movie industry emerged among the Yoruba. 
As early as the 1970s, some of the traveling theater groups had started to improve the distribution of their productions by recording them on film, with which they then traveled the country a development in which the Agunde Theater served as pioneer. From this route, independent movie groups and companies soon began to emerge usually producing movies from themes of Yoruba history and folklore. By the beginning of the 21st century, there were many of these movie companies, and some of their productions, much of which was still rudimentary in technology and sophistication were already entering into the world movie market and featuring in international movie festivals and contests. Conclusion Chapters 17 and 18 have presented an overview of the 20th century history of the Yoruba people. The Yoruba passed from a century of great transformations, the 19th century, to another one of even greater transformations. As the 19th century closed, the Yoruba were losing their independence to alien European conquerors, by 1960, they entered the world as citizens, with other peoples in three independent countries Nigeria, Benin, and Togo. In all three countries, shared citizenship with other nationalities has posed tough challenges and those challenges have been toughest in Nigeria, the largest country. While the economic advantages of living in the large country of Nigeria might seem obvious, for instance, that country's multi-ethnic state experiment has produced, since independence, serious disruptive difficulties and troubles in ethnic conflicts conflicting ethnic ambitions and expectations, rigged and violently disputed elections, violent overthrows of governments, much publicized corruption in public life, a full-scale civil war, and unambiguous signs of disintegration of ethical and cultural values. All these have generally interfered with, slowed down, and distorted, efforts at socio-economic development and progress. For instance, the economic situation in Nigeria, disrupted by frequently recurring political troubles and by other problems, has set in motion a large exodus of Yoruba-educated men and women to all parts of the world, resulting in a substantial and growing modern Yoruba diaspora in many countries. This has robbed the homeland of much of the expected return on the massive Yoruba investment in education since the late 19th century. Moreover, significant sections of the contemporary Yoruba social, religious, political and intellectual leadership see the disruptions of 196,266 in the western region of Nigeria as well as the escalation of public corruption, electoral fraud, and political violence and assassinations, among a substantial part of the Yoruba political elite in the years of the Obas and Joe eight-year presidency, as signs of the impact of Nigeria on Yoruba people, and symptoms of the Yoruba share of the degeneration of people's traditional and ethical values in Nigeria. Yoruba achievements of the century in social and economic development, in education, in businesses and the professions, in scholarship, in the literary and entertainment arts, etc. acquire surprising stature when viewed against this dismal political backdrop. The conclusion at the present point in the history of the Yoruba people can only be that the full measure of what the evolution of the multi-ethnic, multi-nation country holds in store for the Yoruba people in the modern world, and the fullness of Yoruba responses thereto, remain to be seen.